Grocery store shooting to tell you about a 70-year-old man right now behind bars tonight after allegedly shooting a younger man as he was trying to exit a Gig Harbor grocery store. Como's Nick Popham reports police say the suspect identified himself as the shooter and witnesses explained the bizarre circumstances that led up to that shooting. It's an unlikely scenario involving a Safeway in Gig Harbor and a 70-year-old man. Essentially, most shoppers who we talked with say something like this doesn't happen here. They couldn't believe it was happening at their local grocery store. If anyone has a good grasp on the town of Gig Harbor, it would be Al Hansen. Yeah, we've lived at three different locations in Gig Harbor. Three locations over the span of about 40 years. But while at the Safeway on Point Fosdick Drive, waiting for his wife to finish inside the store, he was unaware that this very spot was a crime scene less than 24 hours earlier. I just heard it on the radio, so <laughs> I'm on the spot unknowingly. Which is how many folks we spoke with responded when we told them about what happened here last night when a 70-year-old man tried stopping a 40-year-old who he thought was trying to steal from the store. In the midst of the confusion, Gig Harbor Police says a fight broke out between the two, and the 70-year-old pulled out a gun and shot the 40-year-old, striking him and a glass door near the entrance. In the daylight, the store has now blocked that broken glass with cardboard, but it leaves an uneasy feeling for most folks shopping. Wow, that's getting too close to home. We reached out to Gig Harbor Police for more information, but the department's chief told us no one was available today, but could potentially be available to speak with us tomorrow. The 70-year-old was taken by Gig Harbor Police to the Pierce County Jail. We're told the 40-year-old suffered non-life-threatening injuries. In Gig Harbor, Nick Popham, come on Preston, Dennis Brown has a broken heart. In fact, it is completely shattered. His son is never coming back, and he never thought that would happen, not in his wildest dreams. And now he just wants some kind of justice for his family and others. I thought my kids would bury me one day. I never thought I would be burying my son. Dennis Brown would think it was all a bad dream if his only son's urn wasn't sitting in the living room. I still cried myself to sleep at night. And I know in time that'll go away, but it's still hard because there's so much here that reminds me of Jordan. Jordan was murdered three weeks before his 30th birthday. That March 9th day, Dennis dropped him off at his job at World of Weed. When Dennis went back to pick up Jordan, he saw the crime scene, not knowing why his son didn't answer his texts. When the officers came and told me, half of me left with my son. I could not believe he was telling me my son was dead. Mr. Brown has seen these mugshots of the accused killers many times, and it doesn't get easier. 16-year-old Montrell Hatfield and 15-year-old Marshawn Jones are also accused in over 10 violent robberies in the days before and after Jordan's death. Hatfield's distinctive limp from a prosthetic leg was a key clue. If you could say anything to Montrell and Marshawn, what would you say to them? What were you thinking? Three days before Jordan was killed, the teenagers cut off their ankle monitors and escaped house arrest. We first told you they had been charged with a violent pawn shop robbery, and prosecutors pushed to keep them in jail. But Judge Avril Rothrock let them go home on electronic monitoring. It's really very heartbreaking that that judge made that decision. At the end of the day, those boys took my son life. And that's the heartbreaking thing about it, because the right thing to do was just keep them in jail. I asked the judges why they were released. I was told judges consider factors like criminal history or lack thereof, the seriousness of the charges and family situation, adding the law requires the least restrictive requirements and confinement necessary to provide for safety of the community. Jordan's not walking through that door at night anymore. He's not going in his room at night anymore. We're not going to any football games anymore or anything like that. So that decision affect us all. For Jordan's family, justice now means punishment to the fullest extent. And I hope the justice system works this time. With that pain, they're now left honoring a kind brother and friend who loved music, reading, the outdoors. This photo here, he was out camping. A gifted artist who drew the sketch of his dad's photo from back in the day. And then he said, okay, get it framed, and we're going to put it right here by your room, by your bedroom. <laughs> so, so when I go up, I could always see it. Now that drawing means more to Dennis than ever before. That was him, you know. <laughs> that artist got a creative mind. That was him. He was an all-around just good young man.
Yeah, that's right, Michelle. And that's exactly why one neighbor is very concerned about the bear's health and safety. In fact, he lives in this home right here. That's where he spotted that bear on a camera he installed several times. Officials from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife say they've been looking for this 300 pound male black bear in the Issaquah area for more than two years. This particular bear has a radio or a GPS tracking collar on it. And unfortunately, that collar, those are designed to break and fall off after a period of time. And unfortunately, this collar has not fallen off like it's supposed to. That's a big reason why the state agency wants to find him. Dave Wilkinson lives near Squawk Mountain State Park and says he's seen that bear several times behind his house through this camera he installed. Because the collar's still on, he's worried about the bear's health. And I realized, well, wait, that bear is still out and it's moving slower and it's got more infective looking stuff around its neck. That's when he made a call to the state's Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I called him again saying, well, wait, you know, we got to, you've got to do something serious. It's getting worse. So uh, they really quickly got on the case. We actually had four different culvert traps that were deployed this month. We captured a different black bear and released that one further up into the hills. But so far, this bear has eluded us. And we're really hoping that we'll get additional reports from the public that help key us in. As for what will happen if the bear is captured, the agency will have to make that assessment. Because of the circumstances with this particular bear, we're going to have to make a decision at the time when we capture him. We'll, we'll assess, we'll I make We'll check the bear's size and sex and make sure that we do have the right bear. And at that point, we'll make a decision. Store workers say this new agreement includes pay raises they haven't seen before in the Puget Sound area. And they say that their union plays a big role in that huge win. This is like the best contract we've ever gotten. Will Peterson, a Fred Meyer grocery store cashier with nearly 20 years of experience, is ecstatic. His union, UFCW 3000, and major grocery stores have agreed on a new three-year contract. What is this contract going to mean for you? What it means for me personally is that over the course of the three years in the contract, I'll be getting at least $4 an hour another $4 an hour on top of what I'm already making. That's and that's great. huge. The contract increases wages between $4 and $9 an hour. Union reps say it also offers better health benefits and improves safety guidelines for workers and shoppers. We feel like now we're going to be recognized and we're going to be rewarded for having endured and survived the first year, couple of years of the pandemic. So it's like a big pat on the back to say, you guys, you're important. This is a big win for nearly 25,000 grocery workers in Puget Sound at QFC, Fred Meyer, Safeway and Albertson stores. Also, workers at independent stores like Met Market and Thriftway. Nationwide, there's a big push by workers in other industries to unionize. Back in March, Starbucks baristas at the Broadway and Dennyway location voted unanimously to form a union. What do we want? Starbucks union. About two dozen stores nationwide have voted to unionize under Workers United. Back to the Puget Sound Grocery Workers Union. They say it takes a lot of hard work to score big wins for workers, but it could be a lesson for others hoping to unionize. Doing collective work that workers unified can make big headway, even against companies that are making billions of dollars in profit. You may recall that many grocery store workers received hazard pay for being essential workers during the pandemic, but that stopped nationwide after a few months. A union spokesman says the new contract agreement is important because it offers grocery store workers a guaranteed pay bump and safety measures that cannot be reversed by local leaders. In Seattle, Suzanne Fon, Como News. Hi, everyone. I'm Preston Phillips from Como News. Thanks for checking out the Como YouTube channel. You can see more of our videos right here by clicking on the video link. Links for more news from the Seattle area and Western Washington. Oh, and don't forget to click the subscribe button below so you don't miss our YouTube updates.